and I will probably post, somebody emailed me, I'll probably post the exam, today is Tuesday, I think I've got on this that it is going to be due May the 2nd by 11.59 p.m., which is a week from today. Um, I'll probably have that posted by Thursday evening, if not earlier. It won't be later. It'll definitely be by Thursday. It only covers um, Renaissance Forward, except for the extra credit. Extra credit can go all the way back. I thought that was Mitt Romney. I was like, what the hell are you wearing? Because oh, yes. <laughs> I was going to say, take it off, please. Um, so the ecstasy on focus eyes, 922. I think I mentioned the other day, or asked the question, what is an ecstasy, or what is ecstasy? It's not a date, well, it is a date rape drug, but it's not a date rape drug. It's not sexual ecstasy, not necessarily. Soul leaving the body, it's an out-of-body experience, okay? Whether one believes in that or not, ancient Greek, an ecstatic experience was something where the soul left the body. Where the soul went depends on what you're reading. So, we're like a pillow on a bed, a break, pregnant bank swelled up to rest the violet's reclining head, sat we to one another's best. So, as Dunn often does, he begins with a simile. He wants to create this comparison. So these two people are sitting like a violet on a bank, reclining against the bank. Cool, fine. Our hands were firmly cemented. <coughs> Whatever this thing was I caught last week just won't let go. Our hands were firmly cemented with a fast balm, which thence did spring. Thence did spring. It sprang, this balm, sprang from their hands being together. Probably sweat. Okay? Our eye beams, there's that idea we've talked about before. Dunn makes it literal here. Our eye beams twisted and did thread our eyes upon one double string. Looking into each other's eyes, those beams almost, he doesn't use the language because they didn't, we didn't know about this till what, 1954 or something like that. Almost a double helix imagery is being used here. Be, would have been really cool if he'd done that. Our eye beams twisted and did thread our eyes upon one double string, so to engraft our hands, as yet, was all our means to make us one. And pictures in our eyes to get was all our propagation. Got to make it right. What are those lights telling us? How are the two made one here? They're holding hands, and what was their only form of propagation? He sees himself in her eyes, she sees herself in his eyes. What are we being told? They haven't had sex. Okay? This is all they've done. As twixt two equal armies, fate suspends uncertain victory. Our souls, which to advance their state were gone out, hung twixt her and me. What does that mean, their souls, to advance their state? So they didn't mention last week that their souls uh, were like, um, what do you call it? Bartering, I guess, between each other. Yeah, that's going to come up later because he's going to use the word negotiate. What's, what does he mean, though? You know, our souls to advance their state. What do states do when they enter into negotiations? Countries. They're seeking how to get more power for themselves. They're trying to advance their positions. You, a really bad negotiator goes in and says, I don't really want anything. What do you want? You know, and take everything. 
I, I won't talk politics, I promise. <clears throat> so each soul rises out of the body and they're going to do what? They're going to put their best case forward. Yes, probably. It's also probably similar to, not definitely not the same as, you know, we've talked a lot about the spheres, the Ptolemaic conception. The music, when those spheres all move, which they always do, Dunn's going to have a line, not in here. Dunn refers to, in a couple of his poems, the, what's called the music of the spheres. Pythagoras talked about this, right? The music of the spheres was so is so beautiful, if we heard it with these, these ears, we would be immediately raptured. Now, rapture implies 21st century for those in a certain religious tradition, what? You leave the body, okay? Let's use an older term. You have an ecstatic experience. Your soul leaves your body. You're taken out of your body. That sound just poof, kills you. But it doesn't kill you to Sheol. It raises you up. You get purified by it. All right? So, their souls out there hanging over their bodies, right? Negotiating. This is the prenup, so to speak. Rather than lawyers, the souls are doing it. And whilst our souls negotiate there, we like sepulchral, sepulch, I hate that word, sepulchral statues lay. Stiff, frozen. Not dead, obviously. All day, the same our postures were. And we said nothing all the day. They're just looking into each other's eyes. If any so by love refined that he soul's language understood and by good love were grown all mind, by good love were grown all mind. Plato talks about Aristotle, Socrates, you know, all of them, to use the Latin. The summa bonum, the highest good, when you, when you leave the cave, the allegorical cave, and you go out into the real world, you leave these shadow hands, shadow hands behind, that light that you see, that's the highest good. And the idea is to find the light, go to the light, all right? Aristotle, excuse me, Plato and Socrates say, that's God. That's the highest good, okay? <clears throat> so, if you are refined by love, what does it mean to be refined? Purified. If all the crud is removed, is burned out, okay, then what? If any so by love refined, that he soul's language understood. I don't know about you, I don't hear many souls. I'm kind of glad, because... <laughs> Things walking around, I have a colleague who teaches ghost story stuff. Not that into it. Though I've heard some really good ghost stories, and I have literally been places that I've walked in and said, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> and my wife and I have left immediately. That he soul's language understood, and by good love were grown all mine. Is this like some weird Star Trek episode with the people with the giant heads because they're bringing eggs? No. All mind is getting to this. All intellect. Or he's also kind of using mind synonymously as soul. Grown all soul, all spiritual. That by good love or grown all mind within convenient distance to it. So if somebody was, you know, spying on these two, he Though he knew not which soul spake, because both meant both spake the same. Okay. B 
big long apostrophe. Why? Or parenthetical phrase. He what? Leave the parenthesis. He might thence a new concoction take. What do we have here? Not here, here. This is going to be an illustration of it. It's an idea that gets brought forth by a philosopher 200 years or so after death. Thesis, anti-thesis, lead to what? According to Hegelian dialectic. The synthesis. You mix these two together. They don't, this isn't matter, antimatter, boom, you know, to go back to another Star Trek image. This is, you mix these two, these two come into conflict, and this is what's produced out of them. There's a flaw, however, in this image. What is it? What would the synthesis mean completely? Yeah. If this is the male speaking, this is not speaking. This is the female speaking. What have we been told? Both spake, both meant the same. This isn't an antithesis. It's the same thing. So what should arise out of that? Not a synthesis. It's still this. Okay? So it's, it's kind of a precursor, but it's not really the Hegelian idea. But that person might do what we're told. Might thence a new concoction take. That is, these two mixed together, because this is one and this is one, separate, joined together, what? Something new is made. It's almost like incomplete, Incomplete, joined together, completion, perfection. Go back to very briefly. Where is it? Is it the canonization or is it a valediction? I think it's a canonization. Trying to think of a particular line. The Phoenix, Riddle. Phoenix Riddle. By us two, we being one, are it. So to one neutral thing, both sexes fit. So, this, what? Needs this in order to be complete. This needs this to be complete. And what, you know, you could say thesis or the phoenix, if you want. It rises out of that. So this is what the person who overhears the conversation hears and becomes. That is, just listening to this. Notice the hearer who is so refined by love, what happens? Gets more refined. See, it's not that this is happening to these two. It's that the person listening to this is the one who gets purified. In part, far purer than he came. This ecstasy, this out-of-body experience, doth unperplex, we said, and tell us what we love. I just love that, those lines. It unperplexes us. Why? When the souls are in the bodies, they're what about each other? They are perplexed. The example I used the other day. The question, why do you love me? What does that question mean? I'm perplexed. <laughs> what is it about me that makes me desirable to you? I, I don't know. I'm trying to become unperplexed. Then when the table gets turned, it's like, I don't know either. <laughs> Not, I don't know what about me. It's in response to the question, what, why do you love that? I can't, 
can't put my finger on it. This, the speaker says, excuse me, the speakers say, because remember, both are saying this. Just tell us what we love. We see by this, what's the this? It's the ecstasy. It was not sex. Now, this is kind of odd for Dunn. Because a lot of Dunn's, what are called songs and sonnets, are about sex. I mean, he's one of the most ribald writers in the English language. A lot of innuendo. Okay? It wasn't sex. We see, another one of my favorite lines, we saw not. We see what? Now that we didn't see before. Kind of like the language that we see in Shakespeare's, you know, um, Sweet Sessions of Silent Thought, where he goes back and forth between the tenses. We saw not what did move. What, what does that mean, what did move? What kind of language, what imagery, what metaphor? The spheres. I'm a sphere, you're outside. The implication is we didn't know what caused me to move. And, or, to use another, another image, what drew me to you. What, you know, like magnetic attraction. Dunn loves that image too, just like Shakespeare does. When Shakespeare has Hamlet say to his mother, when she says, Hamlet, come sit beside me, he goes, no, mother, here's metal more attractive. And he's talking about Ophelia's lap. Because right after that, he says, shall I lie in your lap? And she's like, Hamlet, stop. There's people around. He goes, oh, you thought I meant country matters. Notice how I pronounce that word, by the way. She's like, I don't know what you mean. I'm just a big zero. And Hamlet's like, yeah, that's what. <laughs> don't go there. So a lot of critics have written about that. OK? So. We see, we saw not what did move. Fine. But as all several souls contain a mixture of things, they know not what. Love, these mixed souls, doth mix again and makes both one, each this and that. What? Dunn pays back. Really close reading. That is, you gotta just get in the nitty gritty. It's like weeding a garden. You gotta tease the meaning out. We see, we saw not what did move it, as all several souls contain mixture of things. As all several souls. That means every soul contains a mixture of things. What mixture? What things? Close, but not quite. Right. That's we didn't know what moved us before. We know it wasn't sex. Okay. So then he goes and talks about the composition of souls. Well, what's your soul made up of? <laughs> that's what he's getting at. Old idea, ancient Greek idea, gets revived in the Renaissance. Not necessarily believed in the Renaissance. It gets revived because it's a nice image. Is that we are all composed of a variety of things. All right? In the Middle Ages and Renaissance, you have this notion of the humors. That there are these four humors, which are like these spirits. Not ooh, spirits, but like almost like alcohol spirits. You know? Whiskey, tequila, all those, those are called spirits. Why? They have a strong fume to them, too. So you have these humors in your body, but they're not equally mixed. Some of us are more phlegmatic than others. Some of us have more bile than others. Some of us have more, I can't remember what the other two are. Bile is what leads to anger, hot-headedness. In the Harry Potter series, Harry's best friend, Ron Weasley, his middle name is Bilius. Bilious means full of bile, or son of bile. It means hot-headed. He's also red-headed. Sorry, 
Redheads are hot-tempered, supposedly, or feisty, okay? So, you have these humors, you also have what? Go back to the beginning, Greek philosophers. What is everything we see around us made of? Four primary elements. What are they? Earth, air, water, and fire, okay? If they're mixed equally, everything's great, but they never are. They're always mixed partially. Some of us have more fire, we're more angry. Some of us have more earth, we're kind of dullards. Some of us have more water, we're always you know, hacking up stuff, okay, etc. So, as all several souls contain mixture of things, that's what he's talking about. Mixture of the four elements and the mixture of the humors. They know not what, that is, the souls don't know what they're composed of. Love, love does what? Love, these mixed souls, mixes again. The souls interpenetrate, so to speak. So what happens? And makes both one, each this and that. In other words, it's this again. Just as male and female coming together cancel out, cancel out, did something my finger did, but they, and become neutral, what happens to the souls when they mix? Let's use an example. Let's say the soul needs 100% salt, and he's got 90%. She adds 10%. He's now got it. Or the soul needs... 30% air, he's got extra air. Each does what? Cue the Jerry Maguire line. You complete me. You add what I'm missing. So they're mutually symbiotic. They're mutually symbiotic. Without, without her, he's not full. He's not complete. And if you're not complete, I should have mentioned this before, if everything isn't mixed equally, guess what happens? You die. That's why we die. None of us are perfectly mixed. Okay? Until we find what's the phrase that's still used today? E-harmony and all those, you know, internet, find your love, blah, blah, blah. Find your soulmate. That is the one that just as physically it happens, completes you. Love these mixed souls doth mix again and makes both one, each this and that. Okay, bear in mind, they're both saying this simultaneously. His soul speaking, her soul speaking. A single violet transplant, and we go back to our opening image. There's a reason why he chose a violet. A single violet transplant, the strength, the color, and the size, all which before was poor and scant. That is, you take a violet like you do irises and daylilies and stuff, and you break part of it off. So it's removed from the whole, and now it's just partial. It's small. It's little. Does what? The strength, the color, and the size, all which before because it was smaller and it was removed from the whole, redoubles still and multiplies. Okay, cool. But we don't do that. When love with one another so, when love, not with love, when love with one another so enter in animates. So leave the first two prefixes out. And just go with the root word, animates. What does it mean to animate? Give life to. Louder? Give life to. To give life to. How many of you have been in classes before? Because I've had people tell me this. How many of you have been in classes before where your instructor is not animated? It's more like an animatronic instructor. It's <laughs> and the voice is just one constant. <laughs> just drones. I've walked by classes before and I've heard professors and I've seen students. Okay. 
It's one of the reasons why I vary my loudness and why I usually close the door. I've literally had colleagues from across the building tell me I'm too loud. <clears throat> so, when love with one another so animates, what are the first two prefixes? Enter, between, in, inside. So between inside gives life to when love in these two souls together inside gives life to two souls. That abler soul, and here we are, the soul that is produced by the joining together, the inter in animation of these two which thinks the flow defects of loneliness controls. Defects of loneliness. In other words, speaking about 2023, we should go back and we should all start playing and listening and have on national media all the time. The song from the 60s, what the, world's need, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing we've got, anybody know the rest of the line? Too little of. Why? According to a lot of surveys, the number one problem literally around the world, not just in the United States, I mentioned this the other day, loneliness. We're more connected than ever, and yet we're more within our little existential slash needlest boxes than ever before. I mean, teen suicide is the number one cause of death of teens. Not drugs, drugs are involved, not car crashes, not alcohol, suicide. Teens ought, should not be committed, people like me should be committing suicide thinking of the world that we used to live in compared to, I won't call it the brave new world that we're inhabiting now. Teens have everything in the future to live for unless they see what? No future. Only darkness and despair. Hmm. So, that abler soul defects of loneliness controls. We then, why? Because they're both speaking. We then, who are this new soul, know of what we are composed and made. So earlier, we see, it wasn't sex. We see, we saw not what did move. Now, we, who are this new soul, know of what we're composed and made. For the atomies of which we grow, that is the atoms, the smallest elements, because at this point they thought atoms were the smallest things in the universe, of which we grow are souls whom no change can invade. Why? Ancient Greek philosophy, early Christian philosophy, Christian you know, belief system today, which is influenced by Greek philosophy, souls are immortal. See, change implies death. Souls are immortal. But, oh, alas, so long, so far, our bodies, why do we forbear? Now, what does that sound like? So they're looking at each other, eye beams are twisting, making little me's in her eyes, she's making little me's in my eyes. Souls are out of the body, the souls are now mixing up, the souls understand now what attracted them. It wasn't sex, but then we get both spake, both meant the same. Alas, so long, so far, our bodies, why do we forbear? What are both souls saying? Why did we leave the bodies? Could be that. 
by forbearing, because the souls have risen out of the body. Louder? Why would we stay in these bodies? Could be. Why would we want to stay in these bodies? When it's so much better being in your twin souls. Is it? How do we know another person's soul? What has to happen first? What must happen before you can fall in love with someone? Keep going. How do you get to know someone? You talk. In other words, what must happen before the souls can leave the bodies? The bodies have got to meet. Hi, my name's, hi, my name's, and whatever. <clears throat> souls don't interact unless bodies do first. So they're up here having this great soul conversation, and then they kind of look down and go, oh, yeah. Forgot about those. So what's meant by forbear? But oh, alas, so long, so far, our bodies, why do we forbear? Is, are they saying that because they've been up here all day and they're going, you know, why are, why are we doing it? Why don't we go back down? What's the implication? We know each other up here. Now we can do what? Now we can let use the biblical metaphor. Now we can know each other down there. First part up until this point in the poems, what? A lot of people read, oh, this is so beautiful. It's, you complete me, you fulfill me, you are, you know, we're one together. Cool, that's fine. Our bodies, why do we forbear? They're ours. Notice what's doing the speaking. The souls. What are the bodies to the souls? That question is going to be answered. Do souls exist without bodies? When? David thought he said yes. Before? Before. Are we Wordsworth? Intimations of odes, intimations of immortality. Where he's standing there, he's looking out over, I think it is Tintern Abbey, and he has this experience and he says, before and I think it was when I was a pre-born soul a soul that was just you know hovering around in the world until my mother and father had sex and was, I got sucked down into this body is it that or because most Christian traditions say nope that's not what happens the soul is created when sperm meets egg kind of thing okay or does a soul exist in a body and then once the body kicks the soul ooh, as virtuous men pass mildly away so let us he says in a valediction for bidding morning when the soul leaves then what do you have a sack of meat it's pretty much it carry a cart sorry carcass it's food let go all, i just finished teaching hamlet go all hamlet it's what Maggot food. I mean, it's one of the things about Hamlet. Hamlet's wrestling with what's the purpose of life. And he has that great speech where he says, you know, we fat other things to fat ourselves. We fat ourselves for what purpose? To fatten maggots. Because Hamlet's wondering, what's the meaning of life? You know, he doesn't first talk about suicide in to be or not to be, which is not a soliloquy, by the way. Because there is another person on the stage, at least one. And two other characters hear everything he says. They can't hear it if they are completely off the stage. Claudius and Polonius. They're listening. It's not a soliloquy. The soliloquy where he talks about suicide is, Oh, that this too, too solely flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the Almighty had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. It's an act two, early in the play. Hamlet's thinking about suicide, okay? So, they're ours, though they're not we. Notice, the soul, the mind, the consciousness, the thing that says, me, that's me. This, thank God, isn't, because this is falling apart. Five more years and I'd walk in and my body parts would literally probably be dropping off. 
I'm just begging, someone please. Six Million Dollar Man was a TV show from the 1970s. Can't we get there now, you bionics and all that? Growing old a bitch. So, so he goes on, which Dunn didn't do, so. Um, he goes. The, though they're not we, we are the intelligences they, and we're back to the spheres again. So what does that mean? The intelligence is what moves, in the Christian model, the intelligence is what moves, governs, controls the sphere. The soul is supposed to govern this. It's not supposed to be the other way around. That's why I go back to the wanderer, go back to the seafarer, seafarer more than the wanderer. Why does the seafarer go out on the water? He's proving himself. Why? Because the delights, he says, of the Lord are greater than the delights of life here. That's why the whole thing's a pilgrimage. What do you do on a pilgrimage? You don't just go visit a shrine and go, oh, look, that's where Thomas died. Woohoo, big deal. Let's tell funny tales, you know. It's what? It's a purification process. Okay? So, we're the intelligences, they, the bodies, the sphere. We owe them things because they thus did us to us at first convey. In other words, if I had never seen the woman who became my wife, she never would have become my wife. Because I first had to see her. Her body conveyed her, the soul animating the body, to my soul animating my body. They did us to us at first convey yielded their forces. What is the power, the faculties of the body? Sensory perception. Right? Think of the canonization for a minute. Where he says, uh, wait, is it the canonization? No, it's not the canonization. It's valediction forbidding warning. Dull sublunary lover's love whose soul of sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. He says, but we are what? We are by love so much refined that we care not eyes less, hands to miss. Back here. We owe them thanks because they thus did us to us at first convey, yielded their forces, apostrophe, since, the word since is an appositive to describe the forces, to us, nor are, and Dunn wants to make sure, and I think this is done, not just, near, not just speaker or persona, Dunn wants to make sure that we understand he's being theologically that is Christian theology, Christianly theologically, correct. Nor, he says, are dross to us, but alloy or alloy. What's the difference between dross and alloy? What's dross? Is Isn't that what's left over after you like smelt that ore? Could be. It's the imperfections. What is an alloy? It's when you put two metals together to do what? To make a stronger metal. So the body, he says, isn't dross. Okay? Modern, modern now, 40 years old. 40? No, 43 years old. Movie from 43 years ago. The second in a major movie trilogy. Anybody know? 1980, 43 years ago. Second, way before all of you were born. Empire Strikes Back. Oh. 
there is a scene. Luke is being trained by Yoda. Anybody know the scene I'm thinking of? Luke's trying to, you know, do all these things, raise stuff, and he says, I can't, master, it's too big. And Yoda says, mm, it's nothing. And he does what? He sits there, and he raises the ship, and he raises Luke, and he raises the boulder, and Luke's like, what the hell? <laughs> and Yoda says, mm, crude physical stuff we are not. He says they are what? Celestial beings. Yoda says, this, this does what? This is an ancient Christian heresy. This holds us back. This is impure. This is bad. The Gnostic and Manichaean heresy. Manichaeism was another religion that gets brought into parts that get adopted into early Christianity to an early Christian heresy that said Jesus had to die essentially so that he could be released from this. This was bad. Okay? Manichaeans saw the whole world, this dualism. Spirit, good. Physical stuff, bad. Christianity said, no. Go back to the beginning of the Bible. What happens? God creates everything. Every day he creates stuff. Physical, material stuff. It says, that's good. Okay? So, physical stuff isn't dross. It isn't impurity. It what? It is an alloy to, when we talk about our physical stuff, it is an alloy to our souls. You don't get one without the other, right? I wouldn't exist if this had never been born. And if this had been born without what's now speaking, it would be what? Just a sack of meat. Slightly smaller one, but still a sack of meat. So, on man, heaven's influence works not so, but that it first imprints the air. What? What is he talking about? What is heaven's influence? He's probably talking about, probably, not positive, when Mary was told, Christian tradition, on March 25th, something's going to happen to you. How was she told that? Was it a little voice in her ear? Did she have a dream? By an angel, Gabriel appeared. When Joseph was told, don't get your wife, She's pregnant. Yeah, I know. It's God's. Okay? Was it just a dream? Probably not. Why? Because we all have dreams. That would be a big one. And most people would go, what did it mean? It, there wasn't any doubt, right? No. So when heaven influences us, as St. Paul says, some people at times do what? Entertain angels unawares. I read a story, don't have time for it, but what the hell. I read a story the other day, Glenn Reynolds linked to it on his Instapundit site, and it was a Facebook post. And it was all about this quote unquote simple guy, town in Oklahoma, small town, 100,000 people, town in Oklahoma, and the guy lived in and around the town square. And he would just go around to the businesses and do stuff for them. He was unemployed. I think he was homeless. His name was Toad. That's all he was known by. And so he'd, you know, do stuff. And people would pay for his meals at the local diner. The shop owners took care of him. He died the other day. 60, 70 something year, years old. And this guy writes as big, long, what is essentially a eulogy. And it's one of the best damn eulogies I've ever read. Because it's about, here's this nobody who did nothing but good. Everybody said, this guy did not have a deceitful bone in his body. And I shared it with 
all 13 of my friends, <laughs> which are mostly family, and people I knew 40 years ago. And I just said, even now, angels go unawares. Angels go among us unawares. Heaven's influence doesn't do what? It doesn't reach out directly and say, Devon, today you will. No. It's more than likely somebody comes up and plants an idea. Fallen angel here. Be careful <laughs> listening to me. So. so soul into the soul may flow. But what? Here's the continuation of how heaven influences us. But that though it to body first repair. Just as heaven influences us by first taking a body, and we could get even more deep theologically, what body? How did heaven really influence us? Little baby, December 25th, God, the infinite, the inexpressible, the uncircumscribable, the outside time in the universe. You know, so when scientists talk about, well, you know, I don't know that there's a God that exists because I've never been able to see it. It's like, you idiot. You're not a, you might be a scientist, but you're not a philosopher of science. Because if you understood the concept of God, he slash it slash she wouldn't be within the universe. Totally outside. Totally separate. You want to talk about the other... <laughs> This is the other, okay? By the way, historically speaking, that's what holy, H-O-L-Y, means. Totally other. Totally not us. Well, maybe you, not me, okay? So it's got to do what first? It's got to go into the body. In order for me to influence you, I've got to physically be here. You, in one sense, got to physically be here. Or maybe you're physically here via YouTube. You know? Scary as hell thought. Anyways. As our blood labors to beget spirits, spirits meaning souls, and those humors that I talked about, they're created by the blood within the body. As like souls as it can. What? Because such fingers need to knit. My absolute favorite line of done. That subtle knot which makes us man. What's that subtle knot? What's subtle mean? I've never been known for being subtle. I lack tact. I'm not diplomatic. I'm pretty blunt. So what's subtlety? Low key. Low key, quiet, demure kind of, mm -hmm. graceful, but there's still a punch there. That is, you, a good ambassador, a good president, I'm not going anywhere with this, should be what? Subtle. Anybody know what Teddy Roosevelt said that relates to subtlety? Speak softly, but carry a big stick. Be ready to beat down your enemies, but talk calmly. That's what Polonius says, by the way, in his advice to his son. So what's that subtle knot? Because a knot, that's what? Is there anything subtle about a knot? You're getting ready to take your shoes off. You've got to do something, you got to change. And the damn things get a knot in them. Because you pull them tight and you're sitting there. There's no, what's the best way to get rid of it? Cut it. So what's the subtle knot? Body, soul. How do you unknot that? You die. Notice there's nothing subtle about that. Because they don't both go on. You pull the thread too tightly. And that knot gets unraveled. 
Because such fingers, what are the fingers? The blood, the body, need to knit that subtle knot which makes us man. So, the simile gets completed because it began with, as our blood labors, so must pure lovers' souls. They're both speaking still. All of this, they're both speaking. So must pure lover souls descend to what? To affections and to faculties which sense may reach and apprehend. Notice, not comprehend, apprehend. In Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus gives an absolutely wonderful speech about lovers, poets, and madmen. And he's talking about the imagination and seeing things that aren't there and how the imagination creates things. And he distinguishes between apprehending and comprehending. Comprehending is understanding. Apprehending is what? Cops don't comprehend suspects. They apprehend them. They take hold of them. Which sense may reach and apprehend. AT&T, Ma Bell, actually, had a commercial back in the late 60s and into the 70s. I think they actually revived it in the 80s or early 90s. If you can't be physically with someone, what can you do? You can reach out and touch them. Were you literally, physically reaching out and touching them? No, it was over telephone lines, which we don't even have anymore today. Are you reaching out to your social friends, your social, and and you have one of these, and it has an address book, right? What are those called? Contacts. What does the word contact mean? To touch. It literally means to touch. When an electrical switch, a relay, turns on, it contacts. That's what the term comes from, okay? We don't contact, though, via these or social media. It is a false image. So must pure lovers, pure lovers, souls descend to affection that the faculties which sense may reach and apprehend He doesn't finish there. Else a great prince in prison lies. If the soul doesn't take hold of the body and its senses, then its place is in a cage. You left out one step before the living in a cage. If the soul doesn't descend into the body, if the soul doesn't animate, control the body, and do what? If it doesn't do something more than that, then it's like a soul or a body in prison. Does the prince would buy the soul? I mean, you can buy the soul into a rule? Yeah, the soul does need to control the body. Does it need to first also find a mate? Bingo. Or reach out. It's got to sensorially, sensually apprehend another. Else what? Else it's in prison. And we could jump to the 21st century, 20th century, existentialism and nihilism. I mean, that's what the 20, 20th century nihilists and existentialists talked about. Nihilists not as much as existentialists. Because the existentialists said, this isn't a good thing. We have to connect with others. The nihilists essentially said, Life sucks, and then you die. (laughs) Either face it, or quit sucking air, and leave more air for others. Kill yourself. (laughs) Literally. The only logical answer, I don't want anybody to do this, by the way. If you're thinking about it, talk to me. The only logical answer, if you are a nihilist, is suicide. Else, as Hamlet says, Why would you suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune 
and the thousand shocks that flesh is natural. If Why would you go through everything if you thought it is all utterly pointless and meaningless? If there is no love, read Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach, where the speaker talks about, oh, this, there is love, blah, blah, blah. You and I are here, he and this girl down at this beach overlooking the English Channel. And he's out there looking at the sea. She's lying in bed waiting for him. And he goes on to this big Sophoclean riff about how life is meaningless. And he's getting ready to climb into bed, seemingly. We're not actually told this. He says, there is no such thing as truth, certainty, or love. But let's pretend. If I were her, boom, I'd go to the next room, find some other guy to, you know, hook up with. We have to do what? We have to break out of that prison. We have to take control. The souls have to take control of the body because what's the purpose of the body, so to speak? What's the purpose of male and female? To come together, to connect. So must pure lover souls descend to affection and to faculties, which sense may reach and apprehend. Why? Because spirit can't. It's one thing for your souls to be up here spending all day having this grand, wonderful talk. But if the souls don't go back into the bodies, that's what? Ultimately, that's not real. To our bodies turn we then. So she goes down to her body, he goes down to his body. To our bodies turn we then, why? Notice there's a reason. That so weak men on love revealed may look. And we're back to the canonization. Last stanza of the canonization says, we beg a pattern of your love. Teach us how, excuse me, <coughs> teach us how to love like you loved. Why? What was their love? You whose love was peace that now is rage. Teach us. So, to our bodies turn we then, that so, weak men on love, notice, love what? Revealed. See, love that's only up here? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments? If it's only a marriage of true minds, doesn't matter. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. That is, this platonic love up here, that's not love until what? Until, as I had over here, person A looks away from person B, looks to person C, it's only real love when person B, Shakespeare, and I would say now done in this passage are suggesting, it's only real love then when person B says, no matter what you do, I still love you. I still, what's love mean? Is love the warm fuzzies? It's commitment. It's a decision that doesn't say, I don't like this decision anymore. I'm going to go back. I'm going to retrace my steps. You know, um, Frost, the road less traveled. I took the road less traveled by, last line of the poem, what does he say at the beginning of that stanza? I will be saying this ages and ages hence with a sigh. Why? Because he knew when he took that road that was less traveled, he wouldn't come back another day because the road in that poem is a metaphor for life. And the speaker is saying, you can't undo decisions. You make a decision. What happens when you choose option A over option B? And it's never really just option A and option B. It's option A and a thousand million billion other options. Those options wiped out. And now you go on, now you're on this path. And then what happens? The road forks again. 
You take one thing and all the other possibilities are gone. Read Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials. First book talks about endless possibilities until you make a point, a decision. And then all those parallel universes, essentially gone. It's beautiful what he does. The rest of the series is horrible, in my opinion, because he goes off on this ideological rant. Okay? Done. <laughs> Maybe we'll finish this before the end of class. One freaking poem. <laughs> Jeez. I love this poem. Should be clear. Else a great prince in prison lies. To our bodies turn with wind. Why? So that some weak men on love revealed may look. Now, I don't know. The poem doesn't make clear. But are the two souls up here seeing the one who is by love so refined? Looking at them and hearing the conversation? Are they wink, winking at each other? Let's go down and give them a show. Love's mysteries in souls do grow. But the body is the book. What's the difference between a mystery and a book? A mystery is inexplicable, but a book is its articulation. Hmm. A mystery is inexplicable, did you say, but a book is its articulation? Or at least the attempt of it. Okay. Can a mystery be articulated? No. But books, what? Mystery. You can read them. <laughs> you should read them, right? How do books work, though? Good books. I'll use C.S. Lewis's example of a good book. Anybody know what it is, by the way? He writes this in Experiment and Criticism. There's a difference between good books and good readers. Actually, they're kind of the same. But it leaves you with mystery. It doesn't answer all the questions. And because it leaves you with mystery and it doesn't answer all the questions, what do you do? You continue to think about it. Keep going. And you go back and read, read it. A good book is a book that you are continually pulled back to. Why? Because every time you read it, you're, every time I teach this poem, it's, it just, it's like this book. There's just more and more pages. It never ends. Okay? Mysteries cannot be resolved. They cannot be answered. They cannot be understood. We attempt to. We use language to try to approach mysteries. Why? Because language in the real world, excuse me, the physical world around us, that's what we see. So we use metaphors to talk about things we don't see. God the Father, the right arm of majesty. Does God literally have an arm? If, if one accepts the notion of God. No. God is spirit. Does that mean God is, you know, if this were really hot, what would we see rising from this little thing? Steam. That's a spirit. Is, is that God? No. What do we use? Lewis talks about this in another essay called Transposition. We argue from the lower to the higher because we can't understand the higher. That's why, you, why we use metaphor. That weak men on love revealed may look, love mysteries and souls do grow. They grow. They multiply. They get larger. But the body, what? Is his book. What's the his? Love. You want to understand love? What do you have to do? You got to go into the body. But uh, yet the body is his book. And if some lover, such as we, wink, wink, have heard this dialogue of one. So now it's like they know the lover is there. The person, why is the person called a lover? Because this person is refined by love. If someone, such as we, have heard this paradox, right? Dialogue of one. Dia means two, across. <laughs> so shouldn't this be a monologue? No, because both are speaking, even though both speak and meant the same. Let him still mark us. What's meant by mark? 
See, take note. take note of. Let him pay attention. Why? He shall see small change when we're two bodies gone. A small change, no change. No. No, it's not. So there will be some change when the souls go back into the bodies. Why? Because there's still perplexity. And the bodies are not perfectly mixed. So the soul's up here, everything's all great, egalitarian. You know, think the French Revolution <laughs> and the motto, liberty, fraternity, egality, etc. You come back into the bodies and what do you have? Well, we're back in 2023. We have imbalances of power. We've got patriarchy, matriarchy, all that stuff. Okay? But the speaker is saying, but there will be small change when we go back down to the bodies. Now, I don't know about you, it's a beautiful love poem. A lot of people read, especially the last few lines, as it'd be better without that. Because what's what are they both saying ultimately? Let's have sex. Let's go back down into our bodies and apprehend each other. It's not overt. It's not uh, overt. Excuse me. Yeah, it's not overt. It's not unsubtle. It's very subtle. Okay. Nineteen minutes. Turn to. And I should probably go on to the other poets, but. We really need to do, I'll, I'll send a video for the other stuff. Dunn's Meditation 17. I should just leave and let Devon talk about it since you wrote a paper on it. Uh, nine, pardon? 940, 941. Dunn wrote this, he wrote all of his meditations, there were 20 something of them, when he was sick in winter of, uh, 19, winter of 1622-23. Thought he was dying. There was a plague, okay, and he writes this book called Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. Emergent occasions means emergency occasions. I think I'm dying, okay, and they're composed like this. You have a Latin phrase, translation, there's a long prayer, which is excluded here, and then an exposition of that, all right? This is the most famous of them. So the setting is, Dunn's lying in bed, near St. Paul's probably, if not in St. Paul's, and he hears a bell tolling. British custom, bells toll for two reasons. One, call you to church, it's time, okay? Two, when somebody dies. When a male dies, the bell rings nine times. Church, local church bell. If a woman dies, it's rung eight times. It's not nine because the man's more important than the woman, therefore there need to be more, more bells. It's just to differentiate so that it would ring eight or nine times, pause, and then it rings again once for each year the person lived. So if it rings eight times, pause once, and stops, you know a one-year-old girl died. If it rings nine times, and 89 times, an 89-year-old guy finally kicked the bucket. What does finally imply? It's past his time, you know, <laughs> my opinion. So, perchance he for whom this bell tolls may be so ill as that he knows not it tolls for him. And perchance I may think myself so much better than I am as that they who are about me and see my state have caused it to toll for me, and I know not that. Just in that opening sentence, what has he told us? Are they ringing the bell for me? Do they know I'm about to kick and they've already started? Like, I'm not dead yet, you know, Monty Python. <laughs> Wham, now you are. Somebody comes and puts the pillows over Dunn's you know, face. The church is Catholic. Notice lower C. And that's why he has universal right after that. Because probably some of his people, some of his audience 
reading this would go, no, it's not. It's Anglican. We threw off those dirty Roman ring kissers, all that kind of stuff. So, the church is Catholic universal. So are all her actions. All that she does belongs to all. That is an old Christian idea. When one person is baptized, as Dunn's going to say, that person is baptized what? Into all the church. That person is fused onto, grafted onto the body of Christ. Some people are heads. Some people are eyes. Some people are made like little hangnails. You know, you just barely hanging on. He goes on. When she baptizes the child, that action concerns me. Why? For that child is thereby connected to that body, which is my head too, and engrafted into that body whereof I am a member. And when she buries a man, so we started with the birth, <laughs> let's get to the end, that action concerns me. All mankind is of one new image of her. Dunn loves this image. All mankind is of one author and is one volume. This is humanity. Some of us have longer pages, some of us have shorter pages. <clears throat> when one man dies, one chapter is not torn out of the book, but translated, just a beautiful image, into a better language. Most people would say English isn't the greatest language in the world. It's not the prettiest language in the world. Listen, listen to Welsh. Listen to French. Oh, you know, all that. Compared to German. It's all guttural, German is. Romance languages are highly vowel oriented. Okay? It's trans it's what? Translated. What does that mean? Literally moved across into a better language. And every chapter must be so translated. God employs several translators. Another image that he loves. Some pieces, some of us are translated by age. Some by sickness. Where are we? We're back in the Wanderer. We're back in Hrothgar's homily. Some by sickness, some by war, some by justice. But God's hand is in every translation. Meaning, no death, is by accident. no death is by accident. Christ tells a follower, God knows even when a sparrow falls. Hamlet alludes to that. Okay? And his hand shall bind up all our scattered leaves. Think of what that image means. Notice, our leaves aren't what? Here, they're not bound into a book. They're individual sheets, thrown here, thrown there. Why? Because there are a lot of people who die totally unknown, totally unrecognized. He binds up all our scattered leaves again for that library where every book shall lie open to one another. Another image he likes. So David's book will lie totally open to Heather's. Whose will lie totally open to Devon's? Whose will lie totally open to him? All the way around. We will all be totally, completely open books. As therefore, back to the bell, the bell that rings to a sermon calls not upon the preacher only, but upon the congregation to come. So this bell Calls us all. Calls us all to what? Hamlet's speech, Act 5, just before he goes to have his fencing match with Laertes. If it be not today, it will be tomorrow. If it be not tomorrow, it will be today. The readiness is all. Being ready for death. So this bell calls us all, but how much more so he's being all great and philosophical, but then he, mm, but I'm the one sitting here with the fever. And the people are sitting around my bed thinking, is he dead yet? But how much more me when brought so near the door by this sickness? 
There is a contention, as far as a suit, in which both piety and dignity, religion and estimation were mingled, which of the religious orders should bring the prayers first in the morning? So the four religious orders, Franciscans, Dominicans, um, Augustinians, and Benedictines, were arguing, which of us should get up first to ring the bells? And logically, they said, you know, whoever woke up first, you ring the bell. If we understand aright the dignity of this bell that tolls for our evening prayer, ah, now he tells us, the bell that's tolling, that's to indicate Vespers is about to be sung. What? We would be glad to make it ours by rising early. That is, by getting ready ahead of time. Notice the language I just used. By getting ready ahead of time. For what? For the bell that rings to prayer. But what else is done suggesting? By getting ready ahead of time for the bell that rings to death. Exactly. We would be glad to make it ours by rising early in that application that it might be ours as well as, hmm, so maybe it isn't a bell ringing for prayer by his whose it is, whose indeed it is. Now he's suggesting the bell is ringing for the death of someone. And I should do what? I should apply that to me. The bell doth toll for him that thinks it doth. And though it intermit again, that is, there's a pause, yet from that minute that that occasion wrought upon him, he is united to God. Why? Christ also said, as a man thinks, so is he. If you think it applies to you, then guess what? It applies to you. St. Paul says, if you think eating something is wrong, then for you it's wrong. If you don't think it's wrong, then it's not wrong. Talking about food sacrificed to idols and stuff. Who casts not up his eye to the sun when it rises? But who takes off his eye from a comet when that breaks out? Who bends not his ear to any bell which upon any occasion rings? And if a phone rang in this classroom right now, I can guarantee you most of you would turn and look. Why? It's out of the ordinary. But who can remove it? Who can remove his ear from that bell which is passing a piece of himself? out of this world. Notice, not the bell that's passing him out of this world, because I don't know about you, but kind of on my deathbed, my final words might be, oh, the hell with it. <laughs> Meaning the world I'm leaving behind. <laughs> Told somebody the other, the other night, we were getting ready for Easter, because our Easter's a week later, and we were talking. And we were talking about all the craziness going on in the world. I said, you know, Bill, all I say every day is, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Just into the halls right now. No man is an island entire of itself. Anybody? I think I alluded to the other day a rock group, folk group, from the 1960s who had a song, The Boxer. And the boxer had the line, it's a great song, I am a rock, I am an island. What is meant by that? The exact opposite of what Dunn is saying here. Okay, and if you know nothing else about Paul Simon, he was extremely well read. He had to have known this, poem, this meditation. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent. What is the continent that every man is a piece of? Humanity. We're all part of humanity. So what's Dunn saying? When that homeless guy under the bridge over Broad Street dies, then nobody knows about it. 
What? A little bit of us dies too. When a king dies, when a queen dies, Queen Elizabeth, part of us dies too. Is there any difference between the homeless guy under the bridge and Queen Elizabeth? No, there's not. From Hamlet's perspective, they both become food for maggots. Okay? Done. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clog be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. As well as if a promontory were. A clod. A little clump of dirt as opposed to a promontory. Homeless guy, president. As if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me. Why? Dickens, A Christmas Carol, because I am involved in mankind. Why did I say Dickens, A Christmas Carol? Any of you know? Jacob Marley goes and visits Ebenezer Scrooge, the first ghostly visit of the evening. And what does Scrooge say? Jacob, you are a great businessman. You blah, blah, blah. And what does Jacob Marley do? He shakes his chains and says, anybody know what it is? Mankind was my business. I, mean, I get chills every time I think of that. Because he's saying, Scrooge, I've got all this for my lifetime. Your chains are, I think he says, seven times as much. Mankind was my business, not counting my gold. Every man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never sin to know for whom the bell tolls. Why does Hemingway title his novel that? That's not for whom the bell tolls. For whom the bell tolls. It's kind of like the whole, can you ask him God when everybody's too good as you are? We are all connected. That novel is written about Hemingway's experiences in the Civil War in Spain in 1937-38. As a journalist, kind of, but taking part with the Marxists against the fascists. Okay. Neither can we call this a begging of misery. A lot of my students go, I'll see things like every now and then, and like every five years, I'll look at rate my professor for whatever reason. You know, Sherman's morbid. All he does is talk about death all the time. Why? It's not a begging of misery. It's what? It's a reminder. The misery's already here, folks. <laughs> what happens? Literally every stinking year. That happens every moment. Universities. People die. Somebody goes off half cocked and shoots a bunch of people or at schools. And I'm a big Second Amendment, Amendment supporter. I'm, I'm not knocking guns or anything. I'm just. So this isn't a begging of misery or a borrowing of misery, as though we were not miserable enough of ourselves. Um, but must fetch in more from the next house. Truly, it were an excusable covetousness if we did. That is, if we didn't have any misery, it would be appropriate to want somebody's misery. Why? Because affliction is a treasure. Okay, bear in mind who's writing this. John Dunn, this is six years after his wife dies. His wife who delivered 12 children, four of whom were stillborn. That means eight of whom are still alive. She's dead. He's raising them. Probably has help, I would assume. He knows misery. He says, affliction is a treasure and scarce any man hath enough of it. Now there's kind of where I'd go, John, Jack. Let's throw a few beers back. Because mm, I can think of a few people who've had enough misery, who've had enough affliction. No man hath affliction enough that is not matured and ripened by it and made fit for God by that affliction. In other words, is this just a version of what doesn't kill you makes it stronger? 
kind of. Okay. Cue the country music, yeah, rock song. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. This is better put, <laughs> I would say. If a man carry treasure in bullion or in a wedge of gold, but have none coined into current money, his treasure will not defray, defray him as he travels, right? Walk into Walmart with a bar of gold. See how much you'll be able to buy. Not going to do you any good. Tribulation is treasure in the nature of it. So what do we have to do to the nature of it? We have to do what? Turn it into current money. How? How do you turn affliction into something you can use? Wanderer, seafarer, Beowulf, dream of the rude, and I could go on and we could teach a bunch, a whole bunch of other old English literature. It's all about it. Another man may be sick too, and sick to death. And this affliction may lie in his bowels as gold in a mine and be of no use. Why? What does the man not turn the affliction into? Strength? Perspective? But the spell that tells me of his affliction digs out and applies that gold to me. How so? Because I take mine own death into consideration. How does he turn the affliction into gold? It's preparing me. The readiness is all. That's become my favorite phrase since teaching Hamlet a few years ago. It prepares. The, the entire, I tell my students when I teach Harry Potter, the entire Harry Potter series is about one thing, how to die well. Harry knows he's going to die. Everybody dies. But you can die different ways. You can die kicking and screaming, or you can die as virtuous men pass mildly away. Or by applying the crap and turning it into something. Or, that's ultimately two choices. Done seems to be saying. Okay, sorry we didn't get to the others, but I will send something, because they wouldn't actually take that long, um, for the Herbert... Uh, Herrick and Marvel. One comment that I need to make, because I think it's going to show up on the exam. Three of the writers we've chosen, or we've read, were all priests. Dunn was a priest, Herrick was a priest, and Herbert was a priest, sorry. One of those writers only wrote religious verse. George Herbert. He doesn't address sex, Drinking, drugs, rock and roll, anything else. Dunn and Herrick, they kind of cover the whole smorgasbord. They do it all, okay? All right, stop there. Thank you. I hope you learned something this semester.